Hello friends, how are you today? Namu myoho rengekyo. I hope you're in good health and secure. <clears throat> Let me start off by saying, um, yeah, I might be blinking a lot today or clearing my throat or my voice sounds different. I, uh, after the last video, a couple days ago, I was using um, a, a trim, what do they call them, string trimmers to do yard work. And I wasn't wearing safety glasses. I have a shield I usually wear, but yesterday, or I, it's spring. I'm just starting up the tools again, and I'm forgetting safety protocols. So anyway, something flew up and hit me in the eye, and uh, whether it's a, a scratch that's healing or an allergic reaction, my eye is red and swollen and gooing up. Um, it's a little better today, so that's why I thought I'd go ahead and do a video, but it's affecting me. So if you notice that, um, I apologize. Um, I hope that this will still be an informative, um, session. And, uh, before I jump back into the go show, we've been reading, uh, the writing on, uh, the treatise on protecting the nation. You know, ultimately, everything comes down to our attitude and intent. I keep saying that, right? And I wanted to discuss something today that I haven't talked about in quite a long time. Um, and it has two symbiotic components. One is, what the heck are we talking about when we, call, when we talk about Buddhist wisdom or Buddha wisdom, Right? Um, which is tied into the same question in a, in a samsaric way. What do we call knowledge? What is knowledge? What do we think we know? And how do we know? And what that? what is that? Um, which resolves to a term that a lot of people don't normally hear is epistemology. Epistemology is that study of how do we make knowledge? How do we create what we consider to be knowledge okay and um and this also dovetails into how to understand the teachings how to understand ourselves and in that is an aspect of relationship we're samsaric beings we have many, many relationships, whether we see them as relationships or not. That's just a function of how you understand the way our organisms work. We're social creatures. And um, like it or not, the very fact that you exist as a human being, you start this life, this human life with re relationship, relationship to the womb that you grew in. Yeah. Yeah. You manifest from a certain path and, and that can end with your mother. It can include your father. It can include siblings. It can include ancestry. All depends on how you choose to view your relationships. And of course, then that's applied throughout life. Belonging to a club, uh, being part of an organization, uh, the corporate entity in the world today has learned to use uh, that sense of belonging as a tool to um, make employees, workers, feel community in their 
which is why they end up access, we accept less pay, we accept less right. Um, just because they give us a place to get chocolate bars for free, we suddenly feel like uh, we're invested in this family called corporation, right? Uh, so relationship, uh, all of that is just to say relationships are in every aspect of our lives. Um, and what we think we know from our experience is vital for us to understand how we make or break or involve ourselves and at what depth relationships. Because as I want to point out, we're in a relationship with ourselves and Buddhism is right there at that point of understanding. So first of all, what do we mean when we say Buddha wisdom? Again, the tendency in the world is to think that that's somehow we, we, we are given or imbued with from some external source an extra facility of understanding. Without, you know, dissecting it any further than that, that's actually how we tend to think because we're belonging creatures and we're, we're, uh, we're acutely aware that our environment is a reflection of ourselves. We don't think of it that way, but we have an expectation that our environment will somehow provide us, whether it's the corporation, it's the planet, or it's some external forces that we receive insights from. And I want to disabuse you of that, and I want you to consider that, be mindful of that all day long, because we do it so instantaneously, we don't truly think about that. We just grab data, and we put it in our cubby holes, right? That's what we do. We parse information. Consider for a moment when you have conversations with others, opinions that you may have or that your friends may have, how often when you're, and, and you could say most of communication is a sharing of ideas and um, opinions, right? But how often do we check those opinions for factual evidence, for for actual experience in order to build the basis of causality and effect that may, that allows our reasoning faculties to make an educated, in other words, researched supposition, an opinion, right? Not very often. Our will to be liked, our will to belong, our will to be um, part of something larger, all of that. Our will to have an identity and to attach that identity to some structure. We listen and take on uh, upon ourselves opinions, and this is why they're called opinions, without proof, without actual experimentation, without experiencing. And we take it from any source, no matter how, we don't check their experience. We don't check, well, you know, and yet we can go to a medical professional who's studied for a dozen years about things, telling us that something that we don't want to accept. And we'll think we're smarter and, and not just smarter, but that we know better. And I'm not saying that's not sometimes right because the doctor's just as much a human as you are, right? But this is what we do. This is our human samsaric thing. We just pick and choose and decide, I can identify with that, I can identify with that, and therefore these are th truths. 
But that's not wisdom. How do we do that? Why do we do that? What is the mechanism in our brain that says, accept this information at face value, there's a term, without investigating it, without reasoning it out, just accept it whole and act as though you're carrying the flag of whatever this is. Humans do that a lot. It starts in childhood, right? So now, back to the conversation. You're expressing thoughts that you're having that are being built from a thousand different places as you go along, as you stream along, without a whole lot of reasoning. You're plucking from this database of things I've heard, things that are popular, things that I can, that I can show my distinctive level of being with by adding my own rhetoric to something I've never really checked out. But because it has a bonus of making me one of those or one of these, right? Belonging to something popular, then I will espouse these words. And we never stop to think or not often anyways, how the listener, let's say it's just one person, hears those very same words through their multiple thousands of filters of identity. And even if they go, yeah, yeah, I totally get what you mean, they don't. They get your stream of memetics they analyze and chew them their own way and pick and choose stuff they like and choose to discard the stuff they either don't get or don't like. And yep, you're right, man. I'm just like you. You ever, you know, it's like, and then they offer their stream of thoughts and stuff. And you'll listen to that and go, well, it's not exactly the same, but yeah, I get you too. It's a wonder we ever truly communicate, really because of the shifting sands of meaning that we're constantly negotiating in the effort to have a relationship. Because that's a large part of communication, right? Communication sounds like we're offering knowledge for knowledge. But the way we construct our knowledge is very slippery and the overriding desire in communication is simply supporting the relationship, the belonging to, the friendship, the association, the whatever. Now, you know, this conversation so far would make you, would it make any of us feel like, gosh, I don't really know what the hell I'm talking about or doing at any given moment. And yet there have been moments I've been extremely passionate about what I'm saying to the point where they give me feedback about some experience of theirs. And I'm like, no, 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 you don't get what I'm saying. First of all, they feel hurt. They may not show it, but then what, well, what are you talking about then? So you try again and you pull from these memetics and these, I can all go on and on, but I think you understand the example, right? So this is our samsaric knowledge we're working with, and it's pretty haphazard. Now, thinking epistemologically, we may have to dig through a tremendous amount of history in our lives to come up with where the seeds of accepting certain kinds of things as fact without ever having experienced those certain things there's, there's at some point a decision, a very core decision was made about anything that was relatable to that experience. And your yay or nay of opinions from that point on is colored by 
that one decision you made when maybe you were four years old. I've used the barking, biting dog analogy before, right? That's the simplest one I can come up with. If you grow up, and when every kid, when they see a dog, unless the dog is very threatening, every kid wants to reach out and pet a dog. But what if that's not your experience? What if your early childhood formations of data, information, were all around dogs that were frothing at the mouth, barking at you like they were going to eat you alive? That's a shock that you feel in your body and mind. And then no matter how much you reason with yourself through your childhood, through your teen years, through your young adulthood, you can fight that fear and learn how to have, you might even have a dog as a pet. Or you might not ever entertain the notion of a dog as a pet. All based on that starting point, very deeply ingrained in your epistemology, that anything dog related is to be questioned, feared, right? And you may not ever think about that. That, that may be completely forgotten as an actual living memory in your conscious mind. And yet, beneath your conscious mind, that, that karma has been logged. It's been entrenched in your wisdom. And it affects everything you think about. Stray dogs. God, you can't have stray dogs. That's so dangerous. That's so irresponsible. Ah, right? We, our opinions are formed of thoughts or, in, or, or constructed epistemologies that construct our thoughts and our knowledge through those filters, many of which, most of which, we're not even aware of as we're making decisions as to where, whether something is valid or invalid. All right, so let's bring it back to Buddhism now. What are we talking about when we talk about Buddha wisdom? Sorry, my low back. I'm a mess right now. <laughs> um... So when we chant, Namo Myoho Renge Kyo, we are Namu, samsaric being, present and open to instantiate single-mindedly Myoho Renge Kyo, right? Instantiating our Buddha in mind, the Buddha in our mind. The Buddha doesn't have that baggage. The Buddha mind doesn't have that epistemology. That Buddha mind isn't constructed. The Buddha mind is the foundation of all experience of life. It's not tainted. It's not colored. It's a clear experiential view. There's no baggage attached to it. And in our samsaric mind, with that clarity of Buddha, we can build new thoughts. Every thought moment, right? So those 3,000 realms in every single thought moment then goes through an additional filter of clarity, Buddha. And that realm hasn't got all of this attachment of opinions, of what's been heard, of what's been experienced, of doubts, of fear, of any of that. It just sees very clearly. And with that clear vision, we then affect our samsaric mind, our human mind, and imbue it with a new wisdom, an unencumbered wisdom, an unaffected wisdom. That is Buddha wisdom. Does that make sense? 
And where does that come from? Within our own samsaric entity, our mind. So it's not given to us. It's not something that we, um, we find or discover. It's been there all along, that Buddha clarity, but we haven't inculcated it into our living experience, our mind. That's the tool of the Daimoku, this mandala, and our practice. To tap into that clarity, which is unjudged, unjudgmental, uncompartmentalized, unconstructed. The fundament of all phenomena. You just see it, experience it. And as your human mind experiences it, a lot of all that other garbage, that knowledge that we've constructed from our epistemology, just falls off like ice off of a rocket when it takes off. It just, it can't hold on anymore. That's Buddha, right? All right, so... Ugh. I said all of that in 20 minutes. I apologize for my oohs and ahs and my dripping eye. <laughs> mess. So um, I'm encouraging myself to continue my study because that's practice and that practice will ameliorate these stupid bodily problems that I'm dealing with and I'm not going to let them be obstacles. I just don't want you to worry if you hear little groans or uh, drips from my eye because I feel one right now. All right, so we are in the treatise on protecting the nation, right? Let's continue with that. Question. Do you have any scriptural passages proving that the Lotus Sutra alone will remain even after the other sutras all disappear? You probably already know the answer to this, but it's a very direct question. So, Nitrin answers. In the 10th chapter on, quote, the teacher of the Dharma, end quote, of the Lotus Sutra, the Sutra itself, Shakyamuni Buddha declared in order to spread the Sutra, quote, the Sutras I have preached number immeasurable thousands, ten thousands, and a hundred millions. Of course, the Sutras I have preached, am now preaching, and will preach, this Lotus Sutra is the most difficult to believe and to understand, so on and so forth, end quote. And why does he say that? What does that mean, most difficult to believe and most difficult to understand? Maybe it should be the other way around. Difficult to understand because look at the analysis we just had just on the basis of what is knowledge. And of what is knowledge, what is Buddha wisdom? knowledge. Wisdom, knowledge, they're interchangeable terms, but there is a difference, right? Because knowledge is really something we uh, construct in our samsaric mind. It's that compartmentalizing, identifying, so on and so forth. But when we do it with the clarity of Buddha in our mind, it's no longer attached to all of the life uh, samsaric saha world mundane experiences like the dog barking right buddha doesn't see that as a threat ever he just sees that or buddha just sees that as a manifestation of life in its own expression there is no fear there is no typing and categorizing and identifying there is just wow look at that That's wisdom in that if our thinking is informed by that kind of experience, we don't make attachments. We don't make compartmentalizing. We don't identify self with that. Disconnected observer. Arguably, that observer can see with greater clarity 
without all of the obfuscating constructed knowledge. That is wisdom. Difference, right? Of the sutras I have preached, now preaching and will preach, that the Lotus Sutra is the most difficult to believe in. Why difficult to believe? Because our samsaric identity is stubborn. We're afraid we're going to lose something. If we allow Buddha in our minds, we're going to lose all those wonderful colorations and panics and joys of all our constructed knowledge. So it's difficult to believe that the Buddha in our minds is a superior experience of life. I mean, again, it's about attachment, isn't it? And we're very stubborn about our attachments because that's how we identify ourselves. So Buddhism asks you to change your myth. It, Buddhism says, okay, you are all those things in the Saha world and all those things that you identify yourself as are the reason you're discontent, that you have anxiety, that you're stressed, that you're fearful, that all of the things that make you uncomfortable or sad, or whatever. Those are constructed by your idea of what and who you are. And Buddha, by instantiating Buddha in your mind, you will see much clearer your true identity, which isn't all that stuff. But it's hard to tell yourself that because that means, well, that you know, I know that, you know, that causes me this or that, but uh, I don't want to lose it. But you're not. See, this is, the, this is the difficult part of this practice. Thinking that you're going to lose something about yourself rather than understanding that everything's still there. But with your mind, you can experience it without all the fettered baggage of fears and, uh, and all the rest of the emotions and so on and so forth. To see clearly what your life and all life is, there is no loss in that. There is simply a paradigm shift. You change your mind and you see everything anew. That's a significant obstacle for investing confidence in which i like better as a as a series of words than believing there's a certain aspect of that english word believing that it has a surrender attached to it right i surrender to these things as immovable immutable and buddhism says no that's a load of crap everything is mutable all the time Just look, understand from a different point of view, Buddha point of view, Buddha wisdom point of view. You can do this. It's already a part of what you are. You just need to use it. You're not going to lose anything. You're going to gain tremendous insight. Hmm? So again, I don't like that word believing. I know it's in a lot of translations, but... There you have cultural bias, right? But hopefully now you understand better what that means. It means that all of the sutras which the Buddha has preached, is now preaching, and will preach during the 50... During 50 years of his lifetime, the Lotus Sutra is the supreme accomplishment, the supreme sutra. Of the 80,000 holy teachings, holy... It was preached especially to be retained for people in the future, the Bodhisattvas of the earth, you and I. Therefore, in the following chapter on, quote, the appearance of the stupa of treasures, the jeweled stupa, the treasure tower, the Buddha of many treasures emerges from the great earth coming in the future. The, and the Buddhas in manifestation from the worlds all over the universe gathered, because this is, Universal truth. 
through these Buddhas in manifestation as his messengers, Shakyamuni Buddha made this declaration to bodhisattvas, shravakas, pratyaka Buddhas, heavenly beings, human beings, and eight kinds of supernatural beings who filled the innumerable 400 trillion Nayuta worlds in eight directions. In other words, this is for all sentient beings. And here's the quote. The purpose of the Buddha of many treasures is uh, to emerge and gathering of Buddhas in manifestation all over the universe is solely in order for the Lotus Sutra to last forever. Each of you should vow that you will certainly spread this Lotus Sutra in the future worlds of the five defilements after the sutras which have been preached, are being preached, and will be preached will have all disappeared and it will be difficult to, to take confidence in the true Dharma, the Lotus Sutra. This is the exhortation he made to you and I, the future bodhisattvas of the earth. So Nichiren continues, then 20,000 bodhisattvas and 80 trillion nayuta of bodhisattvas each made a vow in the 13th chapter on, quote, the encouragement for upholding this sutra. I think in some translation it's called a happy life. Quote, we will not spare even our lives. Now this is our words being in captured in this sermon our vow, what does that sound like? We will not spare even our lives, but treasure the unsurpassed way. End quote. Bodhisattvas emerged from the great earth as numerous as dust particles of the entire world, as well as such bodhisattvas as Manjushri and all also vowed in the 22nd chapter on the transmission chapter. After the death of the Buddha, we will widely spread this sutra. And so on. After the death of the Buddha, we will widely spread this sutra. After that, in the 23rd chapter on, quote, the previous life of medicine king Bodhisattva, end quote, the Buddha used 10 similes in order to explain the superiority of the Lotus Sutra over all the other sutras. In the first simile, the pre-Lotus Sutras are likened to river water and the Lotus Sutra to the great ocean. In other words, they're valid, but they're not, they don't provide for your immediate enlightenment. They're just, they're a supporting venture pouring into the ultimate teaching, the ocean. Just as ocean water will not decrease even when river water dries up in a severe drought, the Lotus Sutra will remain unchanged even when the pre-Lotus Sutras with four tastes all disappear in the latter age of defilement and corruption without shame. Having preached this, the Buddha clearly expressed his true intent as follows, quote, After I have entered nirvana, during the last 500-year period, you must spread this sutra widely throughout the world, lest it should be lost. And there's that, that uh, anxiety, right? Contemplating the meaning of this passage, I believe that the character after following after I have entered nirvana, is meant to be, quote, after the extinction of those sutras preached in 40 years or so, end quote. It is therefore stated in the Nirvana Sutra, the postscript of the Lotus Sutra, quote, I shall entrust the propagation of this supreme dharma to the bodhisattvas who are skillful in debate. Such a dharma will be able to last forever, continue to prosper, for incalculable generations, profiting and pacifying the people. Pacifying. Again, another tough English translation to pacifying meaning uh, quelling our fears, quelling our samsaric stresses and anxieties. 
According to these scriptural passages, the Lotus Nirvana Sutras will not become extinct for immeasurable centuries. Nevertheless, not knowing this, scholars in the world consider, quote, the extinction of Buddhism in the last fifth 500-year period, end quote, predicted in the Sutra of the Great Assembly, which is a provisional sutra, applicable to the Lotus and Nirvana Sutras. It hadn't even preached yet insisting that they will be extinct before the Triple Pure Land Sutras. That's just an earlier sutra. It, it's teaching others, not teaching self. Theirs is a misinterpretation which has forgotten the significance of the whole Lotus Sutra from the beginning to the end. If they bothered to read the Lotus Sutra, they would understand that it supersedes all the Pure Land Sutras but they don't want to hear it. Where are we time-wise? One more question. As said earlier, such months as Dan Luan, Tao Cho, Shen Tao, and the Venerable Eshin, or Geshin, all regarded the Lotus Shingon Sutras unsuitable for the latter age. Accordingly, Genku Honen Shonen and his disciples called the Lotus Shingon's teachings, quote, miscellaneous practices, unnecessary for rebirth in the pure land, rejecting them as difficult to practice, and slandered practitioners of these teachings as bandits, villains, or heretics. <sighs> Shokobo likened them to grandfather's shoes too big to be useful, and Namubo said that they were unworthy of string music, which comfort people. In short, these opinions held that the Lotus and Shingon teachings do not suit the times and the capacity of the people to understand. What do you think of their contention? Answer. Dividing the preachings of 50 years in his lifetime into two, provisional and true, Shakyamuni Buddha himself clearly declared that we should discard provisional sutras and seek refuge in the true sutras. So what are these pure land teachers teaching people? It's false. They're contradicting the founder's words. The very, <laughs> it's always been a mystery to me how Buddhism is an amazing, amazing insight into the nature of life. And then these teachers come along and say, yeah, yeah, it's, it's all that, but the way we do it is superior. Really? How does that work? Thus it is stated in the second chapter on expedience of the Lotus Sutra that the Buddha preached provisional sutras in 40 years or so because he was afraid that, quote, the people would be unable to understand and sink in pain if he praised only the way to the one way he praised only the way to Buddhahood. He nevertheless was also concerned that, quote, if I guide people merely with Hinayana Dharma, even just one person, I would be committing the sin of greed. Because he'd be, he'd be trying to satisfy his own ego. Therefore, in order to avoid committing such a sin and upholding, quote, his, practice, his basic purpose of leading people into Mahayana teaching, end quote, the Buddha expounded the Lotus Sutra, achieving his purpose. Now, I've talked about that before. The goal of Siddhartha Gautama, before he attained enlightenment, was to find a universal method for all human beings, all sentient beings, no matter what their status or condition in life, could invoke a life state that left all these attachments and sense and these uh, stresses and anxieties uh, out of their experience. That was the whole goal. And the Lotus Sutra is that self-practice. So, yeah, of course, it is the culminating teaching. It's what he was getting to all along. He just had to nurse people's 
capacity throughout time as he moved around and as would be, be developed in later generations, right? Then in preaching the Nirvana Sutra, the Buddha promised, quote, After my death, I will entrust four reliances, leading master, masters people can rely upon to spread both provisional and true teachings. End quote. Accordingly, Bodhisattva Nagarjuna, appearing in this world 800 years after the death of Buddha, wrote such provisional commentaries as the commentary on the Ten Stages, in which he expounded Mahayana Sutras as the Flower Garland Sutra, Hodo Sutras, and the Wisdom Sutra. He also authored the Great Wisdom Discourse, distinguishing between the Lotus and Wisdom Sutras, claiming the former to be the true Mahayana superior to the latter. The Wisdom Sutras are the perfection of Wisdom Sutras we've talked about, right? Bodhisattva Vasubandhu, who was born into this world 900 years after the death of Buddha, explained Hinayana Sutras in his treatise on the repository of Abhidharma discussion, expounded the Hodo Sutras and the treatise on the theory of consciousness only, and finally wrote the treatise on the Buddha nature, in which he explained the Lotus Nirvana Sutras, distinguishing between sutras revealing the whole truth and those not revealing the whole truth. Thus, both Bodhisattvas Nagarjuna and Vasubandhu did not defy the will of the Buddha by expounded provisional sutras first and then the teachings of the Lotus Nirvana Sutras in the end. So, just that alone should secure those of you who've wondered if Nichiren created this whole thing. No, he never claimed to. His wisdom of history, of history of Buddhism and all of the teachings in proper sequence comes from his forebearers. He didn't create any of this. Later commenters and translators, however, adhered to the provisional sutras and forcibly took words and phrases of true sutras into provisional sutras, causing a mixture of the true and provisional sutras without distinction. Oops. Then, in the time of Chinese masters, Nishi and Ninchi, each sect was based on its own canonical sutras, forcibly despising other sutras as provisional. Well, if you're taking the words of Buddha and you're mixing them up and you're creating warring factions over it, it's just common sense tells you, wait a minute, you're not practicing Buddhism. That has nothing to do with Buddhism. It's not about a, a superior uh, political uh, ideology. There is only one. And there is only one culminating ideology, which was the same uh, structure it was based on in the first place. Liberation for all. Not better or less or whatever that sectarian politic is, right? That's something other. That's not Buddhism. Thus, commentators, translators, and Chinese masters all became more and more against the intent of the Buddha. However, two of the three Pure Land master, uh, masters, Tan Luan and Dao Cho, divided all the scriptures of Buddhism into two groups, difficult to practice and easy to practice. I don't think Shakyamuni ever made that distinction. There's one way, one vehicle. What? So uh, glaringly obvious. Or holy way. A holy way gate and pure land gate. According to the commentary on the ten stages. Had they, um, had they contrary to the commentary included the Lotus Shingon Sutras in their grouping, they would not be considered reliable. Examining the commentary on the Discourse of the Pure Land by Tan Luan and the collection of passages concerning rebirth in the Pure Land by Dao Cho, 
I find they generally follow the opinions of the commentary on the ten stages. So that's a big clue there. Shakyamuni didn't write that collection of passages concerning rebirth in the Pure Land. That was Tan Lao. Uh, yeah. No, Dao, Dao Cho. Anyway, it's really obvious who the authors are. Venerable Shandao also advocated the single practice of chanting the name of the Buddha of infinite life and soul vow of rebirth in the Pure Land according to the teaching of the Triple Pure Land Sutras. But She Lun, Shoran, masters during the four dynasties of Liang, Chen, Sui, and Tang in China, categorized all the scriptures of Buddhism and den denigrated the single practice of Pure Land Buddhism as mere encouragement for idlers. This contradicted the views of Venerable Shantao, who rebuffed the She Lun masters, liking them to bandits because they spoiled the merit of the Nembutsu for rebirth in the Pure Land without fail upon death. They were still hanging on to this reincarnation crap that has nothing to do with Buddhism. Nothing whatsoever. It contradicts the foundations of Buddhism. Impermanence. Anatman. There is no such thing as a soul, a bag of Betty, or a box of Bob. Right? Shandao also labeled the practices of the Shailun masters miscellaneous practices. Well, they're just stuff to keep you busy. Because they insisted that various practices could lead to rebirth in a pure land. He rejected Shailun masters, saying, quote, Even one out of a thousand of them would not be reborn in the pure land, because it was they who began preaching various practices for the purpose of rebirth in the pure land. Thus, the term miscellaneous practices, as used by Shandao, does not refer to masters of the Lotus Shingon, but to Shailun masters. Where are we done with? Yeah, this is good. Where's the next question? Okay, this is going to be a long answer. So, and it, it's getting a little bit into the nitty gritty of the history of Buddhism, which is fine. Uh, and some of you might really enjoy that. So, but for those of us who uh, get a little tired at knowing all of these interreferences, we can appreciate Nietzschean scholarship. But, um, uh, how much of it we need to digest for our own practice. Mm. The, the, uh, the statement, the reasoning, it's pretty clear. It, it, all of this is, me in a, it's a treatise. So it's in a debate form, a formal form, that Nietzsche is writing a document so that anyone who wants to debate these opposite or uh, offense, uh, ah, these other opinions can be brought to the light of truth. Look at what they're doing. It's just not consistent. It, it doesn't match up with Shakyamuni's own words. So what are they doing? They're contradicting Buddhism with something else for whatever reason, right? As he's already identified, politics, greed, honor, blah, blah, blah. Just like anything else. All right, and with all that, I'm going to go I'm going to go nurse my back and my eyeball <laughs> and um, thank you deeply for participating, listening, downloading uh, the auto podcasts, uh, any supporting materials from the free resource website. Uh, certainly don't hesitate to get yourself a mandala of Gohanzan. I may I've had links to that all over this these videos and the website. Um and I have a large library of books that uh, that I've, uh, to varying degrees, either are straight offerings from my own scholarship to assemblages of other scholarship, right? I've rewritten uh, the entire corpus of the uh, Gosho Zenshu. Um, I don't know if I'll do that for uh, these other translations. But uh, if there's something unique enough, I'll, I'll endeavor to make another book. But um, I've made them in larger print, so they're easier to read for humans like me. 
Um, is that tiny, tiny script in that rice paper is just annoys the boof out of me. Um, I want to open a book and just read it, right? So there's a they're larger volumes. Uh, there's six of them in total, and uh, I've endeavored uh, by rewriting. I'm not saying I'm interpreting Nietzsche. By rewriting, I'm saying that I went through and diligently. Uh, looked at the cultural biases of the translators and removed those trigger words that don't belong and replaced them with much more logical, connective words to keep the teaching that Nietzsche intended alive rather than sidetracked by inappropriate terms don't belong in Buddhism. And so hopefully that makes it much clearer to get what Nietzsche was teaching, right? Writing about. So uh, with all of that, once again, please take care of your health. Be kind to yourself. We're all working on the same thing, enlightenment. And uh, like, subscribe, share. You know the drill. Um, and I guess that's it. Uh, I will uh, let you go. And I look forward to talking to you in the next one uh, without a drippy eye or a bad lower back. <laughs> uh, your participation again, I'm truly grateful for. And uh, I will see you in the next one. Bye for now.